Good morning. I get this tablet to work. I think it's almost older than I am. All right, uh, let's pray. Father, you are so, so good to us. God, thank you for letting us be able to come together to worship you together. And Lord, in today's message, I pray that you guard the words that come out of my mouth. God, that you open our ears to hear and receive what you have to say. And Lord, that you would work through it in the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, let me see if I can adjust this table. Here we go. That's better. <laughs> it's set for Sergio, yeah. <laughs> uh, so there was a man uh, who had been stranded alone on a desert island for a long time. One day, a ship happened to be passing by. Uh, and they saw the smoke of his campfire rising up into the sky. And so they sent some folks out on a lifeboat to go rescue him. And when they pulled up on the shore, the guy's standing there waving and jumping up and down ecstatically, just happy to be rescued. Uh, behind him are uh, three huts that they noticed that again, apparently this guy had built. And so before they were gonna leave, you know, the curiosity got the better of them. They said, hey, you know, before we go, what are, what are these three huts all about? And the guy looks and says, well, that one's my home and that one's where I go to church. And then they said, well, what about that third hut over there? Oh, that. He turns and rolls his eyes. That's where I used to go to church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so today I want to talk about maintaining church unity. How to approach and talk about gray areas. And how to reason through our many differences and how to think about issues of possible contention from a biblical perspective. The dangers of division and factionism have been present in the church since its inception. And we know this because the New Testament assumes as much. If the whole point is that God redeems for himself a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, it goes without saying that we all come from different walks of life and what brings us all together is nothing short of the supernatural work of Christ. And if it takes the supernatural to do that, it's obvious that otherwise there's some natural tendency that we have for us to be at odds with one another over some kind of gray area. Um, thankfully, the Bible doesn't stop at just assuming that there will be differences, but it gives us wisdom and direction on how to handle our differences. So my goal for today is to provide you a biblical framework uh, from which you can understand and think about these issues and graciously approach things that might be a point of contention. Uh, so let me just give some examples. And I'm just going to throw these out there and just gauge the, the level of tension in the room as it, <laughs> as it rises. So I'm talking about things like the consumption of alcohol, uh, what genres of music are acceptable to listen to, the types of movies television shows that are acceptable to watch, if at all? Should we celebrate Christmas and Halloween? What about tattoos? How does that fit in there? Playing cards or video games? The dress code in the church or otherwise? How about firearms? That's a, that's a touchy topic sometimes. Uh, politics? Masks? Uh, vaccines, <laughs> uh, turn on the air conditioner a little bit, that'd be good. <laughs> and so here, here's the thing, I'm not going to tell you what to think about any of these topics. My goal for today is to tell you how to think about this from a biblical perspective. So in one sense, I have the easiest job of any of us in the hashtag series because I get to play peacemaker. I don't, I don't, have, I don't have to sit there and tell everyone, hey, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. But on the other hand, uh, this covers just about everything, doesn't it? And if there are toes to be stepped on, they're all here. <laughs> so I pray that we each take a, a sober self-assessment today as we look into God's word and see uh, how we may have conducted ourselves in the past and how we should conduct ourselves going forward. Uh, so on the topic of specific disagreements in the church, um, there are a handful of passages that we could look at um, unfortunately, we don't have time today to look at all of them. 
passage that I wanted to look at today, we're not going to get to. I realized, hey, you know, I've got 20 or 30 minutes of material, and there's just not going to be time to cover it and do it justice. So I'd encourage you to go through and read these things on your own. Now, there's a lot of wisdom to be had, and I'm referring to Romans chapters 13, 14, and 15. If you're taking notes, of 1 Corinthians chapters 8, 9, and 10, reading 8 and 10 back to back. There's some fun nuance there. I'll let you work through that on your own. Uh, Colossians 2, to an extent. And then, you know, there's various passages that talk about Paul and Barnabas' disagreement and falling out, and then they're uh, reuniting with each other, apparently. And I'm sure, I'm sure there are more, but for now, today, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I should have a slide for this, I think. Now, here's a case where the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth about something that was apparently a big sticking point for a lot of people there. He says, all things are lawful, not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. And we're starting at verse 23, by the way, and we're going to go through verses 32 or 33. Eat anything that's sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to go, eat anything that's set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says, hey, this meat sacrificed to idols, don't eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake. I mean, not for your own conscience, but the other man's. For one is my freedom by ju judged by another's conscience. If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered for which I give thanks? Whether then, if you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men and all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, so that they may be saved. So in Corinth, apparently, and in other places as well, uh, idol worship was really rampant. So I'm just giving you some context here. It wasn't uncommon for meat that's being sold in the marketplace to have come from some animal or another that was sacrificed to an idol. In fact, a lot of the church members had come to Christ from such a background. And prior to their conversion, they would participate in these ceremonies and sacrifices. So the genuine question that these Christians had was, if, if I now serve Christ, how can it possibly be okay for me to still eat this meat, if I know where it comes from. Maybe we should even just avoid meat entirely, lest we unknowingly be complicit in secondhand idolatry. That's a fair point, isn't it? It's reasonable. I mean, to me, and I know to you probably also, if you love Jesus, idol worship is unthinkable. I've seen in the Old Testament the consequences for those who so go aside worshiping other gods. And I've seen in Revelation that that hasn't changed. So, you know, maybe we should give second thought before we join our pagan friends for lunch. Or maybe we should avoid the meat in the marketplace too, just to be safe. Yeah, sure, that makes sense. But what's Paul's response? He doesn't say, oh yes, excellent point. Good Christians should abstain from such meat that might be spiritually tainted. He doesn't say that, does he? Nor does he say, hey, don't, don't be silly. Christian, meat's meat. Eat up. <laughs> he says, if you want to, go ahead and eat whatever's set before you without asking questions. If you want to, and someone invites you over to lunch, go with them. Yeah, don't, don't participate in the idol worship. That's evil. But as for the meat, after the fact, there's nothing inherently wrong with meat. The Bible doesn't prohibit the Christian from eating meat. Meat is meat, praise God. <laughs> for the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. So I myself know and am convinced of this, he says. I can partake of it with thanksgiving, give glory to God for it, and no one has any right to slander me for doing so. Why is my freedom judged for another man's conscience? And yet, if you're of a similar opinion of Paul, 
And it doesn't have to be about eating meat, but think about all the things we talked about, and I'm sure you can think of more. If you're of a similar opinion of Paul, Paul also makes it clear your conscience is not the only one that matters. One of your brothers or sisters in your presence voices concern to you. What does he say? He says, don't eat it. Don't eat it for the sake of conscience. And he means not for your own conscience, but the conscience of that other guy who might stumble because of it. Eating meat won't harm your conscience, sure, but it can very well do harm to your brother or sister who does not have the same faith in this area. So for one thing, it can disturb or distract such a person if they have to sit there and endure an act that they think is evil. Now I'm thinking of a, a TV interview that I saw one time. And the host, the news anchor, is sitting there and he's having this uh, segment on veganism. And he invited someone uh, who's a vegan to come talk through the particulars of it with him. Halfway through the interview, a studio assistant comes and brings out this big plate of steak <laughs> and sets it right in front of the news anchor. And then they just carry on with the interview unironically. And he sits there and eats it in front of this person. <laughs> like, wow, man, that's awkward. <laughs> How awkward is that? And, and to be fair to, the, to this person, the, the, the person who didn't eat meat was very classy about it. Um, but how about we don't do that to our brothers and sisters or to anyone else? That's not love, especially to your brothers and sisters, whatever their personal sensitivities are. Yeah, all things may be lawful for you, but all things do not edify. Not all things are profitable. So why cause them undue distress. That's point number one. Even worse than that, though, it might pressure them into doing something that is against their conscience. At the end of uh, Romans 14, which we're going to look at here in a second, at the end of Romans 14, it says, he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and anything not done from faith is sin. I don't want to drive my brother or sister to sin. Paul says, don't destroy your brother and sister for whom Christ died for the sake of food. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. The kingdom of God is not any of those things that I talked about earlier. Do not destroy your brother or sister for the sake of food. And Worst of all, I think, if you act like that, it could set up a wall that prevents someone from receiving the gospel in the first place. And so, even though Paul knows, hey, there's nothing wrong with this, this food that I'm going to eat, he's willing to forgo his Christian liberty for the sake of his fellow believer, who Romans 14 says, and we're going to look at this in a second, says is the weaker brother um, who's weak in faith in this area. Let's go to Romans 14. Uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 4. Now accept the one who's weak in faith, but not to have quarrels over opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but the one who's weak eats only vegetables. There's, there's a verse out of context for you. <laughs> the one who's weak eats only vegetables. Yeah, don't let anyone hit you with that. <laughs> the one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master, he stands or falls, and this part is so encouraging to me. And he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. There are a few other things that, this, uh, that these passages talk about. The observance of holidays or holy days, the attendance of festivals, Sabbath practices, drinking wine. But you can see the clear parallel to the things that we talked about earlier, right? And the message is clear, isn't it? Don't tempt, harm, or make fun of your brother or sister who has a weakness in these areas. Do not regard with contempt the one who does not eat. You know, if you know the scripture is clear or silent on whatever issue, seek their good first and foremost in your relationships with them, and it's okay. Also, I would say to take the initiative too and ask, hey, 
this doesn't bother you, does it? At the same time, it also helps to ask yourself if you've got a, some kind of gray area or issue of disagreement. Ask yourself, am I the weaker brother here? Am I the one who has a problem with this thing that is not prohibited or really talked about in Scripture? Don't attempt to add to God's law and bind the conscience of others with your own traditions and opinions. If, after prayerful consideration, something still bothers you and you can't avoid it, then speak up, you know, discreetly and gently. No one can correct an offense if they were unaware that they gave an offense in the first place. We're all on the same team here. So just to summarize real quick, don't have quarrels about opinions. Newsflash, if you're inclined to be quarrelsome about something or the person you want to talk to wants to be contentious, maybe it's not a good time to have a conversation. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Don't try to change the, the personal convictions and scruples of other people. Bear one another's weaknesses. That's Romans 15. Accommodate your neighbors for their good. Give preference to one another. Seek to serve one another. You can't go wrong with seeking to serve one another. And if, you know, who knows, in the final analysis, like Paul and Barnabas, you decide it's best to serve God separately for a time, and it does happen, it, it shouldn't, but it does, then do it still with love for one another. You see this? Is it making sense? We're still brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we have liberty in these areas. We'll give an account to God for what we do with it. To the Lord we stand or fall, and we will stand for the Lord is able to make us stand. So that's, that's what I want to say about those passages. But I do want to add a caveat here. I think it might be obvious, but I don't want anyone to, to mishear what I'm saying. So don't get it in your head that passages like Romans 14 are a blank check to act however you want and do whatever you want and still be Christian. Sin is sin. And you can't read this text and choose to ignore Jesus' universal commands and call to repentance. Oh, I, I can hear it now, and I've heard it before. You know, judge not the sermon of another. Who are you to judge me? God's my judge. <laughs> yeah, God's your judge. That should scare you. We're talking about issues of conscience here, personal convictions where the testimony of Scripture is not clear on the specifics, or where it grants liberty, but you deem it more profitable for you if you abstain from such liberties. But if the Bible calls it, wrong, calls it wrong, man, it's wrong. You can't say, well, I don't feel bad about it. My conscience doesn't bother me about it, so it must not be wrong. Your conscience comes second. The Word of God comes first. We all have to subject our feelings and beliefs to the standard the Bible sets forth and not the other way around. And I think, I was listening to a guy named uh, Mike Winger, he's a pastor on YouTube, and I think he said it best. He said, conscience can make clean or make unclean uh, the things that are clean for you. Conscience cannot make unclean things clean. So no, Romans 14 is not a blank check. And someone might raise an objection then. If you're thinking through all this for yourself. Well, how do we know? It doesn't mean that. Maybe, Donovan, maybe you're just selling Romans 14 short. That's a fair question. And so I want to make an observation looking at the text. Consider the same Apostle Paul who said these things that we just read also said to Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, retain the standard sound words which you've heard from me and the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Paul says there is a standard of sound teaching that is to be held to, isn't there? Is Paul contradicting himself? Of course not. Not if it's written in scripture. There are standards that we are to still hold to. Uh, Two more examples at the end of the letter of the Corinthians we just read. Paul says, if anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. 
Maranatha, the Lord is coming. The cursed. Hey, Paul, aren't you being a little judgmental? Judge not the servant of another. Gulp. Well, again in Galatians, and this is, and this is a doozy. Uh, Galatians chapter 1. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we said before, if you didn't catch it the first time, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. That's the standard, folks. Accursed. Anathema. Anathema. Separated from Christ. That's a big deal. I have a hard time imagining a rebuke more severe than that. So to summarize, there is a distinction to be made, isn't there? Because some things are permissible. Not everything is permissible. Not everything is negotiable. Not everything is an issue of personal conviction, and there are clear delimitations, boundary markers that God in his wisdom set up for our own good and for his own glory. I've heard uh, Rusty and Sergio call it the difference between open hand and closed hand beliefs. That some things are open handed, meaning, you know, these are either issues of conscience left up to the indiv individual believer or they are doctrinal issues. They're just of secondary importance. We can have a conversation about them. You know, I'm thinking things like well, what, which Bible translation is best. So some people feel really strongly about that, right? Um, let me find, I lost my place here. Which Bible translation is best? Uh, end times beliefs. What you think about eschatology or, or the modes of administration of the sacraments like communion and baptism. Speaking of which, uh, we have open communion in the back. I don't know if anyone said that yet. But if during service or during worship or at the end, anytime you feel led to do so, uh, you're free to partake of that uh, if you're in uh, good standing. Um, so those are open hand issues, whereas other things are closed hand. And we hold on to those things for dear life. We don't let anyone take those things from us. These are non-negotiable beliefs. Beliefs, and I'm talking about there's only one God. He's revealed himself through sacred scripture. The scripture is the word of God. The word of God cannot be broken. That man by nature is dead in his sins and trespasses, deserving of death and God's judgment. That Jesus Christ, truly God and truly man, lived a sinless life and died to take the penalty for our sin. That salvation is a free gift of God's grace. We receive it by placing our faith in Christ Jesus alone. And that Jesus rose from the dead, is coming again, and will raise us from the dead if we're trusting in him. So as we draw to a close... Paul's rebuke to the Galatians is so severe because they sought to compromise the gospel. If even we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be anathema. The things we hold on to so tightly, the fate once and for all delivered to the saints, which Jude says, is the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. And this is what unites us in spite of whatever differences that we have. That is the foundation. Christ alone, cornerstone. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground, sinking sand. You may have heard the, the slogan, uh, doctrine divides. Yeah, that's the truth. The truth divides, so doctrine divides. And I would add to that, in the context of Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 10, that sound doctrine divides soundly and unnecessary doctrine divides unnecessarily. Retain the standard of sound words which you've heard and the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. 
Try to keep things in perspective, yes? Don't be the one who cries wolf all the time. Remember the rule about the strong and weaker brother. Always remember to seek the good of your brother and sister. Remember to keep the unity that is gifted to us in Christ Jesus. The things worth dividing over, who is Jesus, how are we saved, what are we saved from, are those that would undermine the foundation of our unity to begin with. Strive for unity in the things that really matter. If you're going to pick a hill to die on, let that hill be Calvary. Christ has brought us all together as one in himself. And what God has joined together, let no man separate. So consider that the body of Christ, whether this local church, other local expressions of the church, our brothers and sisters across the globe, we, we come from all different walks of life. I'm sure we have different opinions on all kinds of things, but unity doesn't have to mean uniformity. And no matter what you do for a living, no matter where you come from, no matter what Christ has rescued you from and given you to, that we can all turn with one accord and say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was and is and is to come, for there's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. That's a testimony. That's a testimony. That's been the message of the church throughout the centuries. And if you're listening, that's our message to you today. There's no other name in heaven or on earth by which we are to be saved. But Jesus Christ, while we were yet sinners, died for us. You know, I... I know we probably hear the gospel every week or a lot and I hope that we haven't become hardened to it because it's not something we ever graduate from it's not something we ever move past it's not something we ever say yep okay I got it time to go on to something else it's something that we have to preach to ourselves continually every day the gospel is the power of God for salvation for all who believe so I just want to reiterate the Bible says that all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. That not one of us is perfect. There's a theologian who said, not one person in a thousand would tell you that they're perfect. And when we look at the Old Testament, there's not one person among us who could say, yep, I kept all those laws. When we look at the commands of Jesus, there's not one of us in here who could say, yep, I kept all those laws too. But folks, there's not one person in a thousand who understands the seriousness of not being perfect. So I'm pleading with you today, come to Christ. Be delivered from the wrath to come. Jesus says that whoever comes to him, he will by no means cast out. If you're weary, heavy laden, burdened, you've been trying really hard to, to keep things together, you've been trying to earn God's favor, he says don't. Just lay it down and come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for this precious gift of salvation and unity with you and with each other. Lord, I pray that we approach these things with wisdom. God, that every word we speak, every attitude we take, be dripping with your love, with your truth with an eye toward you coming again. Thank you, Lord. It's your name we pray.